put my camera on. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Idep, is someone there from Idep to help back? To help on that? Yes, please. Okay. Can you allow us to put our camera on, everybody? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> it's okay now okay okay um hi adisu uh, uh let me perhaps uh, introduce you and and yeah. and say hello to all the participants um for those who are here today and if not we are recording the recording is on to share it on the online platform so uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Aruna Bolati. I am uh, an economic affairs officer at the ECA sub-regional office for Southern Africa based in Zambia, Lusaka. And welcome to this online training course. We wanted the first session to be live to encourage interactions, but we understand that participants are busy and uh, are combining work and, uh, and many other things, but uh, we look forward for you to catch this, uh, last, uh, this first session uh, online. So uh, this uh, online training course on green technologies for African MSMEs is funded under a project called the Global SME Search Project that started since 2020, where the UN system has been uh, supporting MSMEs address the impacts of COVID. And today's online training course, I mean, this year's online training course is the second uh, online training course that uh, ECA is offering. Last year, we had delivered online a training course, uh, which is similar, looking at the role of technology and innovation in supporting MSMEs to become more competitive so that they can build back better post-COVID. So this year, we are offering the second online training course, and I am very happy to introduce uh, Professor Adisu Lashitu, who is based in Canada, and he will introduce more uh, of himself. And throughout this online training course, the team uh, in Southern Africa has been working very closely with our team of ECA colleagues in Dakar, Senegal, uh, IDEP, which is the uh, UNICA's uh, training arm, research and training arm. And my colleague, Catherine Lalia is also supporting this. And we also have, uh, for this course, a tutor, Mr. Abdullai Mbai, based in Senegal, who will be uh, uh, assisting participants to, uh, uh, to go online, to, to engage in discussions. Uh, and we really, really want this uh, course to be interactive. We want to encourage our participants to read the material regularly, to interact with uh, Professor Adisu, to ask questions online, and, and we hope that uh, all those who have registered, 71 participants had registered, that you will stick with the course and you will finish the course and give us great feedback and especially share case studies, et cetera. So without ado, over to you, uh, Prof, and uh, looking forward. Thank you a lot uh, for the great introduction. Uh, let me start by sharing my slide. Um, Okay, so uh, can you see my slide? I believe you do. My, my name is Adisul Ashto. I am an assistant professor at uh, Master University in Canada. I'm also a non-resident fellow at uh, the Brookings Institution, which is uh, based in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm very happy for the opportunity to uh, present this course um, on green technologies for African small, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, very grateful for IDEP and also for the ECA for uh, coordinating the entire process. So uh, what I intend to do today um, is uh, first introduce the course, the motivations and also some practical aspects of the course. And also uh, um, the course has six modules and uh, I hope to begin with the first module, which is gonna be about um, the sustainability crisis with a particular focus on Africa. Um, so hopefully it's gonna be a one hour long, a little bit longer perhaps, uh, 
but I, I plan it to be an interactive session. So it depends on how uh, the interaction goes as well. Okay, so the policy context is very obvious. Uh, as Aruna mentioned, um, environmental sustainability is one of the pressing challenges of our day. And um, the Paris Agreement is uh, one of the milestone agreements on addressing climate change. And that agreement uh, looks into, considers the role of green technologies for facilitating climate transition. And in Africa, also the African Union is committed to advanced climate resilience through green technologies. Uh, this is also reflected in the ECS commitment to advance a blue and green digital economy growth, economy growth in Africa. So the policy, policy relevance of the course is very straightforward. Uh, what we intend to do in this course is, um, first of all, to start to appreciate the value of green technologies. Uh, we'll start by defining what green technologies are and how they can be used to advance competitiveness. We'll talk about how entrepreneurs can use green technologies to um, improve their own competitiveness, but also to assess their readiness and evaluate the kind of constraints that hold them back. We will talk a lot about policy issues, including financial mechanisms and financing policies related to sustainability. Um, throughout the course, we will cover a number of policy frameworks, uh, strategic frameworks, and tools that entrepreneurs can use uh, for integrating green innovations in their enterprises. We'll, the last two sessions will be about design principles for developing green technologies and uh, about deploying green technologies within enterprises as well. Uh, so the, uh, the pedagogic considerations in this course, our learning approach will be uh, business centered uh, because we expect that the majority of the uh, participants of this course will be uh, entrepreneurs or policymakers uh, working in the areas of uh, small business policy making. So it will be business centered. Uh, we'll try to make it country focused, although the course is continental in scope. Uh, I'll invite you in a number of steps to reflect on the implications of the, uh, the issues considered on your own, in your own respective countries. Uh, it will be case based. We'll introduce a number of cases, uh, video cases, text cases to understand how green technologies are used in Africa and beyond. It will be an active learning experience, uh, meaning that it will be very interactive, especially in the uh, live sessions uh, today in the last session, but also uh, during the recorded sessions that come in between as well. And I'll try to make this course action oriented as well, meaning that uh, with uh, the tutorial with Abdullah will uh, will invite you to reflect on a number of issues that are pertinent in small businesses in Africa, and also we will ask you to develop projects. Which, uh, which you can present at the end of this course as well. So uh, in terms of some procedural issues of the course, uh, this course begins on today and it takes place every Wednesday. Uh, it has six modules, as I mentioned earlier, and the first and the last modules will be live sessions. Um, so, uh, so the last one will be on November 16 at the same time, 1, 1 p.m. UCT. Um, the remaining five sessions will be uh, pre-recorded, so we'll record the uh, lectures and upload it. And also, uh, we'll have we'll use the platform to interact with each other, to exchange feedback, to use online platform for discussions as well. Uh, in terms of evaluation, you will be asking uh, quiz questions at the end of each module, which will make up sixty percent of the total uh, the total mark of the course. And we will also ask you to submit a written report uh, by the end of the course, within one week after the end of the course. And that will be 40% uh, of the final grade. But uh, depending on your participation in the online platform and also the project presentation and the final day, you will have an opportunity to get some bonus points, which, which can um, uh, increase your total grade in the course as well. Uh, so as I said, uh, we have six modules, each presented every Wednesday, starting from today to the last one on November, November 16. And the last one will be live. And I would expect that um, some of you will be presenting your project, final project in the last live session as well. 
Okay, so we have six modules in this course. Uh, the first one is an introduction into the sustainability challenge. Uh, we'll be covering that uh, today. Uh, the next one is on the opportunities and constraints in green technologies. That would be uh, uh, mm, uh, that will be provided on the platform next Wednesday. And two weeks from today, we'll uh, also share on the platform the third uh, module, which is uh, sectoral examples of green technologies. After that, we will cover green financing. Um, the week after, we'll talk about design thinking and how that can be used to develop and also um, the adapt green technologies. And the last session will be on deploying green technologies, plus the final project presentations, which will be presented by the participants uh, as well. <clears throat> so let's get started. So uh, today's session is about the first module, which is uh, about the sustainability challenges or crisis. Uh, what we'll do is describe some of um, the pertinent sustainability issues, crisis, you can say, that are um, besetting our, our, our planet. Uh, we'll try to make it focused on Africa. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the sustainability policy framework that is in uh, play today. Uh, at the global level, but also at uh, continental and national levels. And we'll try to make the case for a green or sustainable business. So um, as I said, this course will be uh, business centered. So we will ask uh, what would entrepreneurs do? How can they begin a transition towards uh, becoming green or sustainable? OK, so. Um, I try to make this course uh, interactive, so I have I decided to start by asking a question. So um, I was not able to create a Zoom poll, but uh, the question I wanted to ask you is: uh, Do you think that environmental sustainability can be good for business? So um, I guess I will ask uh, you to vote on this. If you think the answer is yes, uh, maybe you can raise your hands, and um, we will see. Uh, your view on this subject. So do you think that uh, environmental sustainability is good for business? Okay, so uh, so uh, the next question is, how can environmental sustainability be good for business? Again, I'll ask you to reflect on this uh, for, a short, for a short while. These are some of the questions we'll be uh, trying to cover throughout the course. Uh, the reason why I wanted to start by asking you a question is uh, to get you started in the thinking process, but also to allow you to reflect at the end of the course uh, on your view on this very, very important question. Um, you can consider, uh, an important question also to consider is whether or not your business can thrive under the following three scenarios. Uh, the first scenario, for example, is the year is 2025 and your government has decided to eliminate emissions in 10 years and new carbon tax is introduced, doubling the price of petroleum products. Scenario two, the year is 2030 and a new climate law has come to effect. To do business with the government, you are required to provide an audited certificate of sustainability. Scenario three is the year is 2040, and most companies are at zero waste and pollution. Businesses that are still using polluting technologies are struggling to get new customers. So you, your answer for this question uh, under any of these scenarios could be yes or no, uh, but it pretty much depends on the uh, decisions you make today and the, cho the choices you are making this year and the year after. So the year 2030 looks a long time later, but it's only uh, almost seven years away. And so the choices you make today on investment decisions, for example, can have a significant impact on where you can be in the year 2030 or 2040. 
So um, it's very important to take a long-term perspective, to be proactive and think about uh, how your business would thrive, how your business would perform under similar scenarios. So um, what we strive to do in this course is to help you answer yes to uh, the question under any of these three scenarios. Let's begin our discussion on the sustainability challenge. So uh, what you see in this uh, graph is um, carbon emissions per capita by country or region. Uh, the size of the bars tells you the level of um, emissions per capita and uh, the area of the, sh the shaded area within the respective country tells you the amount of total emissions in that respective country. You can see that countries like the Middle Eastern countries Canada and Saudi Arabia have one of the highest levels of emissions per capita, uh, but Africa has the lowest emissions per capita. In terms of total emissions, China has um, the largest emissions in the world, contributing to up to 30% of total emissions, followed by the US. So um, the question here is, of course, uh, how Africa can contribute to climate change uh, as you can see, Africa's contribution to climate change is very minimal. Uh, this figure tells you, um, the, the figure on the left, on the left tells you the uh, long-term trends in CO2 emissions. And uh, you can see that uh, since the late 19th century, carbon dioxide emissions uh, have been increasing year after year in a dramatic fashion. And of course, we all know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It uh, traps heat from leaving the planet. Also, it leads to global warming. And uh, that is what we see on the figure on the right side of the slide. Uh, that figure was taken from the IPCC report uh, shows you that uh, the Earth's temperature, surface temperature has been consistently rising uh, since the late 19th century. And it's now uh, almost one degree Celsius above pre-industrial uh, revolution time period. So uh, what we see here is of course the direct correspondence being between CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions and a warming climate as well. Um, this, course, this course will be uh, focusing mostly on uh, climate change and the environmental challenges associated with it. But uh, climate change is only one of the many problems facing the planet today. Another uh, sustainability problem is uh, increasing plastic waste. Uh, what you see on the left side of the figure is, for example, a series, uh, plastic waste in millions of tons per year, which has been rising very rapidly in the past few decades. And on the right side, what you can see is the uh, proportion of plastic waste that is recycled, incinerated, and uh, discarded. As you can see, uh, more than half of the plastic waste is just discarded. So uh, since plastic can take decades or sometimes centuries to degrade, it means that the earth is, uh, the environment is now uh, filled with accumulating ton, uh, hundreds of millions of tons of uh, plastic waste, which is also a major catastrophe for um, the ecosystem on land and oceans as well. Another uh, related issue here is, uh, of course, a rising population. You can see in this figure that in the past century, especially um, the global population, human population have dramatically increased to more than 7 billion today. Uh, what this means is that, um, that increased pressure on the environment in order to sustain an increasing population. Uh, for example, some estimates say that in order to fit to feed the global population until 2050, uh, we have to produce uh, in the next 40 years the, an amount of food which is equivalent to the same amount produced in the past 8,000 years. So uh, of course here, uh, this would put a huge pressure on the environment, uh, mainly because in order to increase productivity to that degree, you would have to intensively use uh, fertilizer and pesticides, most of which have a huge pollution effect, but also are based on um, petrochemicals, which are based on uh, you know, carbon emitting technologies as well. When, when it comes to Africa, the effects of climate change are very much pronounced. So um, the uh, 
uh, tragedy about Africa is that it is a continent that made the least contribution to climate change, but at the same time, it is also the continent that's suffering the most uh, out of it as well. So on the left side, you can see what happens to biodiversity loss if climate change would increase by 1.5 degrees Celsius. And you can see that um, many of the local species um, will go extinct uh, in some areas by up to 50%. Uh, if climate change would increase by the highest level we would expect or around four degrees Celsius by the end of the century, uh, the level of uh, biodiversity loss in Africa would be very much significant. And in many places, you can see uh, more than 50% of the local uh, species going extinct as well. So obviously this will have an effect on agriculture. Uh, the figure on the left side shows you uh, what happens when climate change increases by um, uh, as a result of CO2 concentration that is between 520 and 640 uh, particles per million. Uh, you can see that uh, many parts of Africa, especially the Sahel, East Africa and Southeast Africa will experience a radical uh, decline uh, in cereals productivity, which is up to 50% in these areas. So obviously when um, food crop productivity goes down, food prices go up, uh, that's what you see on the right side, uh, side of the, the uh, slide. Uh, these are the CPI, the consumer prices index and the food price index or inflation have been increasing recently because of the war in Ukraine and also because of the increased uh, oil prices. So um, if climate change continues unabated, what would happen is that this fluctuation in food prices and also the radical increase in some cases could continue also dramatically as well. Um, so the, um, the problems caused by climate change in, in Africa are interlinked and multifaceted. In this figure, what you see is uh, the uh, number of climate-related incidents, such as the uh, occurrence of uh, locust swarms, wildfires, extreme heat, drought, and floods. And uh, interestingly, what you see is that this um, climate change-related natural incidents also happen in the same uh, places where war and conflict is happening as well. So uh, many parts of Africa where conflicts are arising uh, are also those parts of Africa where climate change is having a severe effect. Um, it tells us that perhaps climate change is confounding, compounding these uh, problems, uh, political and social crisis as well. In short, when there are um, different natural calamities related to climate change, such as flood, flooding, wildfires, variable and unpredictable rainfall and droughts, we would expect that um, it would destabilize regions, food security becomes an issue, and different social groups or communities could compete with each other for access to these uh, scarce resources, such as water and farmland and pasture land, leading to a political and social crisis as well. So, um, in some, the effects of climate change are really multifaceted and, com and uh, very complex and large scale as well. If we consider the case of Southern Africa, this could be very much illustrative. What you see here is that if we, um, we could expect climate change, uh, global warming to be between two and degree four uh, degrees Celsius in this part of the continent. And uh, that would lead to increased prevalence of extreme weather events and uncertainty in rainfall as well. The effect would be uh, decreasing agricultural productive productivity, uh, more pests and weed in agriculture. Ecosystems would suffer a lot because of um, biodiversity loss I mentioned earlier, but also deforestation could lead to uh, lost livelihoods in some uh, cases. Infrastructures would be affected uh, because of increased natural calamities. Uh, damage roads and bridges and energy systems. This could affect the wider economy as well. Access to water could become a huge problem uh, because of uh, variability in rainfall, but also decrease in reservoirs underground. Uh, health issues could become pro problematic uh, because of vector-borne diseases such as malaria expanding their current scope um, uh, in geographically. 
energy could be a problem as well because uh, petroleum prices are expected to go up and supplies to go down as well, partly because of um, depletion in uh, reserves and partly because of climate policy as well. Okay, so um, let's watch a short introduction video on the topic of climate change. Human activities, from pollution to overpopulation, are driving up the Earth's temperature and fundamentally changing the world around us. The main cause is a phenomenon known as the greenhouse effect. Gases in the atmosphere, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons, let the sun's light in, but keep some of the heat from escaping like the glass walls of a greenhouse. The more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped, strengthening the greenhouse effect and increasing the Earth's temperature. Human activities, like the burning of fossil fuels, have increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by more than a third since the Industrial Revolution. The rapid increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has warmed the planet at an alarming rate. While Earth's climate has fluctuated in the past, atmospheric carbon dioxide hasn't reached today's levels in hundreds of thousands of years. Climate change has consequences for our oceans, our weather, our food sources, and our health. Ice sheets, such as Greenland and Antarctica, are melting. The extra water that was once held in glaciers causes sea levels to rise and spills out of the oceans flooding coastal regions. Warmer temperatures also make weather more extreme. This means not only more intense major storms, floods, and heavy snowfall, but also longer and more frequent droughts. These changes in weather pose challenges. Growing crops becomes more difficult. The areas where plants and animals can live shift and water supplies are diminished. In addition to creating new agricultural challenges, climate change can directly affect people's physical health. In urban areas, the warmer atmosphere creates an environment that traps and increases the amount of smog. This is because smog contains ozone particles, which increase rapidly at higher temperatures. Exposure to higher levels of smog can cause health problems such as asthma, heart disease, and lung cancer. While the rapid rate of climate change is caused by humans, humans are also the ones who can combat it. If we work to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy sources like solar and wind, which don't produce greenhouse gas emissions, we might still be able to prevent some of the worst effects of climate change. Okay. So um, this would be the right moment to reflect on the sustainability challenges. Uh, so I would ask you to think about what would be the most important sustainability problems or challenges in your community or country. So um, if you wish, you can uh, follow the QR code or the short link provided there and provide your answer. So I have a short poll here I would like to present. To allow you to reflect on uh, these challenges. Okay, let's move to um, our slide. So um, 
these steps are very important, um, even for uh, the participants attending the recorded videos. I would ask you to jot down, write down what you consider to be the most pressing environmental problems in your country, but also to reflect on how they can affect your business. Because uh, what we plan to do over the period of this course is to build on um, these questions and uh, ideally to allow you to develop a project uh, that are relevant in your specific case and if you're in your specific organization um, that are related to the sustainability challenge we're discussing here. So um, this would be the time to discuss about the policy environment around climate change. So uh, as uh, I'm sure you all know, since the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, since the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, the world has come to an agreement to keep global warming well below two degrees Celsius and preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the way this is implemented is by countries individually determining or adopting what is called NDCs, nationally determined contributions. This states the amount of emission reduction targets for each country, and these are revised every five years. So the NDCs are non-binding, meaning that there is no legal, legal mechanism for forcing countries to, uh, to comply by their emissions reduction targets, but they are revised every five years and the revisions are supposed to be more strict every time. So they should be, the reduction should be uh, uh, positive all the time. So there should be a decline in, in, in emissions. Uh, the same is there's no enforcement mechanism because we don't have a global government, but also uh, the Paris Agreement did not specify the conditions for, um, did not provide for very particular conditions, but allows for a global carbon market and also includes a commitment for by developed countries to provide financing for uh, developing countries by up to $100 billion per year. As I said earlier, uh, developing countries, including African countries, have made the least contribution to climate change, but they are one of some of the most affected countries, uh, which is a justification for this development assistance. Uh, if you look at recent trends, however, uh, most countries are unlikely to make uh, to meet their commitments under the Paris Agreement uh, because. Um, uh, that would require emissions to decline by half by 2030, but uh, at the current trend, uh, emissions are likely to stabilize much later around 2050, leading to a global uh, temperature increase of uh, almost three degrees Celsius. So the Paris Agreement provides a nice framework, but it's not being uh, made at this point in time. We can only hope that uh, the countries will be more serious in meeting their commitments in the future. So um, this slide shows you some of uh, the, uh, the countries that are ad adopted a commitment that's in line with the Paris Agreement. So some countries have already achieved um, climate transition. These are uh, Suriname and Bhutan, which are very naturally endowed countries. So these countries have actually a, a, a negative contribution to climate change, meaning that they have large sinks of uh, CO2 that contribute to climate change reduction or mitigation. In many countries, especially in European countries, uh, climate transition is already adopted by law. Some of countries like, like Sweden promise to achieve climate transition or to be climate neutral by 2045. Most other countries plan to be climate neutral by 2050. So climate neutral means um, the level of CO2 emissions becomes zero, basically, uh, either because uh, emissions are cut to zero or because whatever remaining emissions there are, are compensated for through uh, uh, what we call emissions offsets or by planting trees and other things in the home country or in other countries as well. In many other countries, there is a proposed law to pass a climate transition policy. This includes the European Union, Canada, and a number of other countries. Um, uh, some other countries have made pledges. Uh, this includes, includes many countries in uh, the developing world. Uh, many African countries are proposing or discussing climate policy in their uh, 
legal framework. So you can see that many African countries here are laggards when it comes to climate change. So um, there are some debates on adopting climate transition and integrating it into the law, but that is not implemented yet. So um, part of the reason behind the delay in adopting climate law in Africa could be uh, public awareness to the crisis. So um, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, in 2021, around a very large survey that covered more than a million people, more than uh, 1.2 million people, asking people to reflect on the climate crisis. So the question was, is climate change a global emergency? So, so what you see here is that uh, the responses generally were high for many African countries. In South Africa, for example, is the fourth, uh, the fifth, the sixth uh, uh, country in terms of the number of people who responded yes uh, to the question if climate change is a global emergency and Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria have also relatively high response rates indicating that um, climate change is actually considered to be um, a major challenge in many African countries. And uh, of course, this is not uh, many other countries. The response is below 50%. The countries that are shown, that are not shown in this figure. Uh, so uh, the, the response or the climate Climate awareness is not universally present in Africa, but you can say that in major countries, it's considered to be a major threat. So um, one thing I would like to ask you participants to do in this course is reflect on your own positions on, uh, the, cli on the climate crisis as well. For example, a lot of people, uh, hopefully not including you, are ignorant about global warming. So they would be questioning the science behind global warming. Others could be uh, quite agnostic about it. So they see that cli climate change is a conflicted debate. So maybe there is no answer. So they conclude they don't know. Other people deny uh, or they state that they don't care. Some people acknowledge the crisis and try to understand the problem. Other people are aware about, conscious about the, problem, the climate change crisis. After consciousness, of course, action comes. So some people are act, acting on the global warming crisis. But we also realize that action should be universal. So it's not enough if you act if other people are not following suit. So some people are concerned that the reaction is too slow or not universal enough. And that leads to worries about the current crisis um, or, or about the ability of the global, um, uh, the, our planet to respond to the climate crisis, which could lead to fatalism, meaning that uh, life on earth is doomed, so we cannot do anything about it, but accept our fate uh, and see what happens if climate change goes out of control. So what I wanna ask you to do is to uh, reflect on this question yourself. So, you can use the QR code provided there or the short link provided there and vote where you stand. So um, I'm sure you're not ignorant or agnostic, but um, I will ask you to provide your answer where you stand on the climate crisis. Uh, so uh, Maunal Sultani asks us, energy production is a major contribution of CO2. So um, is nuclear energy a solution for Africa? That's a good question. So we're gonna come to, actually that's I think the next set of slides. We're gonna talk about uh, what is contributing to uh, CO2 emissions in Africa. Thank you for that question. Okay, so let's look at, 
what the sustainability crisis looks like in Africa. So these figures are taken from the IPCC report, the latest uh, report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, on the left panel, what you see is regional per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so you can see that Africa has actually one of the least emissions per capita. So um, what Africa does to mitigate climate change is not really um, important because uh, our contribution is already uh, limited, although many countries are growing. So you know, in, the future, in the future, you might say that uh, that could be a problem. So that's what you see on the right side of the, uh, the, sl the slide. Uh, in Asia, you can see that greenhouse emissions are rising very rapidly. Uh, in Europe, uh, which is uh, depicted by the green line, CO2 emissions are uh, going down somewhat, stabilizing or going down. In Africa, which is the uh, yellow line, emissions are increasing, but very barely, and they are also very small. So uh, in some, uh, this is a reiteration of the point I made earlier, CO2, in terms of CO2 emissions, or generally greenhouse gas emissions, Africa's contribution is very minimal. Although you might say that uh, given the large population size and the large uh, growth potential of Africa, this could be a problem for the future. So what are the most, uh, the countries that are contributing the most for greenhouse gas emissions in Africa? So you can see that South Africa has the highest level of emissions per capita in Africa. I'm sorry, the highest number of amount of CO2 emissions in total, greenhouse gas emissions, I should say. Nigeria has the second, followed by Egypt, Algeria, and Ethiopia. So obviously environmental footprint, or in this case, greenhouse gas emissions is proportional to economic size and population size as well. On the right hand side, what you see is um, the uh, different greenhouse gases that make contribution to climate change. And you can see that in Africa, CH4, which is methane and CO2 or carbon dioxide have more or less equal contribution to total greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a little bit um, surprising because if you look at the data in other countries, especially in the US, for example, nearly 80% of the total emissions are coming from uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, while methane is uh, contributing to 10% of total emissions. So obviously in Africa, partly because of um, low level of electrification and partly because of the use of hydropower and other electric sources, CO2 emissions are relatively smaller compared to say um, methane releases. Uh, which are high partly because of agricultural production and also because of the presence of large wetlands in African countries such as uh, Sudan. Uh, so this figure breaks down the sectors that are contributing the most to um, greenhouse gas emissions in Africa. So the light blue uh, part of the bars shows energy related CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. The deeper blue at the top of the bars indicates what is called land use change and forestry or LUCF. So basically land use change and forestry is related to you know, wetlands emitting methane, but also deforestation and expanded agricultural use and et cetera. So you can see that the contribution of the two is more or less the same. Uh, as I said, this is very, unusual, so it's distinct to Africa. Um, another important source of emissions in Africa is, um, is uh, energy, which is shown, uh, I'm sorry, is agriculture, which is shown in the brown uh, part of the bar. So if you combine agriculture and land use change and forestry, the two together contribute to 56% of total emissions in Africa. So, if you are concerned about mitigating climate change and uh, reducing CO2 emissions in Africa, so the areas to look at would be, uh, first of all, uh, agriculture and forestry, plus energy as well. So the energy share is, uh, as I said, uh, just, below, just above one third or 35%, which is significantly lower to the rest of the world. Here, this is uh, CO2 contribution uh, emissions by sector. So in the rest of the world, you can see that energy 
contributes to 73% of total emissions, which is twice as much as the proportional contribution of the energy sector in Africa. As I said, this has to do with uh, limited electricity, electrification in Africa, but also reliance on hydro energy. So, um, of course, um, 35 percent in Africa uh, of CO2 emissions is also large and large, and nuclear energy, as uh, uh, raised by the participant, participant earlier, could play a role in uh, mitigating that part of uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. Okay, so this figure breaks down. I apologize for the noise. Uh, this is the uh, fire alarm siren being tested in my apartment. I'll resume the uh, presentation in half a minute, I believe. Uh, this figure uh, shows some uh, emissions in Africa in the manufacturing sector. Uh, you can see that uh, specifically when it comes to manufacturing, uh, more than half of the total emissions come from cement production, what is shown by um, the uh, black colored part of the bar, and also in power generation, which is shown in the pink colored part of the bar. So if you look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions by um, in the manufacturing sector, the countries that are making the greatest contribution are also the largest countries, uh, especially in South Africa. Egypt, Algeria, and Nigeria, uh, plus Morocco and Ghana as well. Okay, so we're approaching the uh, last uh, parts of the, uh, uh, the lecture today. So the next part, we'll be talking about how green businesses can um, address the climate challenge in the context of Africa. So uh, climate change is, um, you, you might say, a double-edged sword. Uh, on the negative side, it can uh, affect small and medium enterprises or SMEs uh, by disrupting their operations in many ways. Uh, I mentioned earlier, for example, that agricultural productivity could be affected, food prices could go high, um, raw materials could become more expensive, energy supplies could be uh, less reliable, that's going to affect um, small and medium enterprises in Africa adversely. But at the same time, it also provides an opportunity. Uh, these opportunities could include contributing to climate change mitigation. Uh, carbon trade is not in place today, but it might be possible to trade carbon if you are uh, a positive contributing, uh, making a positive contribution to emissions reduction, you might trade carbon. But there are many ways uh, in which uh, small businesses can contribute to climate change resilience by providing support, for example, for providing a climate insurance, weather insurance for farmers that are affected by climate change. That would be one example. So we'll be talking more about those business opportunities today, but also in other parts of this course.
So uh, triple bottom line is one of uh, the ways um, people describe green business practices. So um, triple bottom line means businesses address not a single bottom line or profit, but multiple bottom lines or three bottom lines, which include client, people, and profit. And that happens when, according to Professor Colin Mayer, the purpose of business is to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet. I apologize once again. So um, what we mean by a triple bottom line is when companies, uh, when businesses try to make profit by providing solutions to environmental problems, but also addressing people's problems or society's problems. So um, the main point here is that we are not talking about philanthropic activities where companies make money in one, a certain domain, domain and then channel that money to address environmental problems or social problems, but rather uh, business integrate environmental and social issues into their core business activities and make it a focus of their main business goal. So um, this figure shows you a number of areas where um, businesses can contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation. For example, they can contribute to water protection and management that can contribute to the agricultural sector by introducing climate smart technologies, improving forestry practices, for introducing organic fertilizers and other, other inputs of agriculture that are more sustainable. They can also contribute to the provision of uh, sustainable energy by introducing climate smart energy systems, introducing energy efficient um, systems of production, uh, renewable energy sources such as small hydro, off-grid hydro, off-grid electricity sources, solar energy, and etc. They could use also IT and data to provide early warning systems that can improve uh, readiness to climate change related crisis. Uh, businesses can provide ecosystem services um, by facilitating the uh, conservation of marine, fishery, and coastal resources. Uh, so, uh, in health, also, they can provide smart sanitation systems to improve uh, health outcomes in their communities. They can contribute to um, climate resilient and climate smart infrastructure uh, in terms of roads, power grids, uh, etc. So uh, basically, the, uh, the opportunities for business created by climate change are basically unlimited, you might say. So they run through uh, multiple sectors and their size can be vast as well. So uh, I'm sure you, all, you, you have all heard about the Sustainable Development Goals. These are the goals adopted by the United Nations in 2015, signed by nearly all members of the United Nations. Uh, these goals try to, you know, eliminate poverty by 2030. Uh, eliminate hunger, improve good health and well-being. So companies, by green businesses can contribute to uh, not only climate change, but also to one of the 17 goals stated by the United Nations. In doing so, the idea is creating a win-win outcome. Basically, um, as a business owner, you would be able to create profit for yourself but also you'll be able to contribute to climate, uh, to mitigating climate change, to adapting climate change, or to improving one of the, contributing to one of the goals of the 17 goals of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This slide shows you um, 
green business opportunities identified by um, McKinsey and company in 2021. So in their report, it's also indicated in the course outline, we'll share that uh, in the platform. In that report, um, they rank different industries in Africa based on their environmental impact, which is shown in the vertical line, and practical feasibility, which is shown on the horizontal line. So you can see that the shaded area on the top right corner of the, uh, the rectangle uh, indicates activities that are high environmental impact, but also are highly feasible. So um, this includes especially uh, number five, number 12, and number seven. So the size of the circles tells you the market potential of these economic activities by 2030. So if you look at number five, for example, it refers to the production of bioethanol as a low carbon fuel alternative for transport and cooking. Basically, this includes different biodiesels and ethanol uh, that can substitute for uh, petroleum products. Number seven is um, the manufacture of parts of wind turbine turbines, especially turbine towers, uh, which can be very important because wind power could be a major source, renewable source of energy in the coming few decades in Africa. Number 12 is uh, the manufacture of cross laminated timber or other alternatives to cement. Uh, this is important because timber is a renewable energy uh, while cement, uh, cement partly it's not renewable and partly because uh, as I showed you earlier, cement production is one of the major contribu contributors to greenhouse gas emissions in Africa. So if different African countries would try to meet their commitments under the Paris Agreement, they would make uh, petroleum products more expensive, making cement more expensive, uh, which could make uh, uh, timber products much more appealing in the future. So mm, there are many other industries identified. You can consult the full report for other examples. Uh, we will watch a short uh, movie. We're approaching the uh, close of this lecture. Uh, after this short clip, we will discuss, uh, I'll pose a discussion question and wrap up uh, to today's program. The weather has guided and shaped human activity throughout our history. From agriculture to fishing, the weather has told us when to move and when to be still. But the weather is changing. The science is clear. We have to cut our carbon emissions drastically in the next decade. If we continue business as usual, without taking climate action, extreme weather events caused by a changing climate will irreversibly alter how we live our day-to-day -day lives. Extreme heat kills. Prolonged heat waves, a consequence of the climate crisis, are beyond what people can cope with. The same goes for plants and animals. In Africa, average temperatures are rising faster than the global rate. I have seen how much the climate crisis has affected the people in my community, in my country, and in the African continent. With the rising global temperatures, the African continent faces a risk of changing and disruption of weather patterns, hence bringing about shorter and heavier rainy seasons that cause flooding and longer and hotter dry spells in many parts of the continent. African countries are expected to become more urban and less climate resilient. The lack of trees in city centers means no shade, increased temperatures, and less capacity to endure floods. Flash floods destroy infrastructure and leave already vulnerable communities more exposed. In the Sahel, climate change destroys our crops, our homes, but also families who are the victim of forced migrations. We have already seen locust swamps destroy an entire season's harvest in Eastern Africa. The swamps in Kenya in 2020 are the worst they have been in 70 years. Human-made climate change creates the perfect conditions for more swamps to thrive. But Africa, it's not only the most impacted continents. It is the continents of millions of citizens determined to stop climate change. 
to move away from fossil fuels, who will stand up to protect our forests and our biodiversity from industrialized agriculture. Billionaire classes holding the commons and wealth of African countries means fewer resources to go around, which may lead to increases in violence and conflict. We need governments to protect the people they are charged with. We need an immediate just transition towards renewable energy. We need global change inspired by local action. The climate crisis is affecting many lives. It is destroying livelihoods. Our leaders must do something about this. Stand with us. Fight for the future. Fight for all our futures. Call on your government to declare a climate emergency. Okay, so this could be a moment to reflect. So um, the short video, the nar narrator was asking, asked to call on our governments to declare a climate emergency. But what can governments or society in general do to address climate change? In particular, what can your organization do to help address these problems? You can use the QR code and the short link provided there to reflect on these comments. So um, every week we'll also post a question, a discussion question in the online platform. So uh, we have prepared, we have already shared this question for you on the online platform. Please go ahead and uh, provide the response. As I said in the beginning, uh, who is uh, responding, who is participating in that platform and potentially um, you might get a bonus point if your contribution is uh, insightful and relevant for the case. And uh, that is the discussion for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to continuing to discuss with you uh, on this very important subject in the coming few weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adisu, uh, for this uh, uh, very nice, uh, illustrative, reflective uh, first lecture. Uh, maybe we can open the floor to the participants who did connect today. Uh, if you could perhaps put your camera on and please feel free to ask any, uh, any questions. Over to you. Please feel free, don't be shy. We are a, a small group today. Hi, just introduce yourself. Um, if you can turn on your camera, it's great. If not, you can just uh, speak as well. Um, hello, everyone. So can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I hope you're all doing great. And I am very excited to start this journey with you guys. And I am Kate Asibouen. And I'm 21 years old and I'm currently on my second year of uni and currently studying BS at HRM, which is um, Human Resource Management. And yes, I find it very interesting. The first, um, this, this first session was very, um, very motivating for me to continue it. And thank you so much, sir, because uh, this is very encouraging to um, debut on this journey with you guys. So thank you so much. Looking forward for more um, details and information about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyla. Thank you for. Uh... Your very positive comment. Um, I hope you do have access to the platform. Feel free to reach out. Our emails are provided in the platform. There's a chat box there as well. If you have any questions or if you have um, some issues, uh, you want access to materials, whatever questions you might have, feel free to reach out.
Yes, I will surely go through them. And I am from Mauritius. I forgot to mention. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Hello, I'm Simla Fertub from Mauritius again. I'm from Mauritius. I'm a, a crisis communication consultant, AI consultant, and currently in my uh, second year of MSc Climate Change, Health and Disaster Management. And I wanted to join this uh, short course with uh, the aim to understand more about the green technology because uh, I was uh, I embarked recently on uh, a journey of uh, agricultural shift. So it is a, a way to get some takeaways from this course. Also, thank you for all for everything. Thank you, Simla. Good to hear from you. Again, feel free to reach out on the platform if you have any questions. Abdullaye is here to uh, help you guide through this course. I'm also here, so uh, yeah, we're here to serve you. So feel free to ask any questions. Uh, as I said, the last session is also live. So we look forward to you to be present on the live session. We are hoping that some of you will be presenting uh, on that session. So I would encourage you to take that up, uh, Simla, but also Kalia. So if you wanna develop your project uh, over the course of uh, the coming few weeks and at the end of the project, uh, we'll give you maybe five minutes you can share it with your uh, other participants. So you'll get a bonus point by doing that. Uh, we don't have time to allow everyone to do it, but you could be, uh, you're welcome to participate. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think, uh, Prof, we are, we are done for the day and we will put it online and yep. we look forward for the rest. Uh, so I think we can say goodbye for now. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you.